everybody, and welcome back to SFC's Food for Thought series. My name is Hannah, um, and I'm a third year student at UT Natural Science. I've been with SFC for about a year and a half now. Uh, with me today is Kira and Lyndon. Lyndon, do you want to give yourself a quick introduction? Yeah, hey, cool. Uh, I'm Lyndon. I think we've met before. Uh, I'm a recent graduate at the UL, uh, where I finished with a history degree, and I've been with uh, SFC since 2020. Sure. Hi, I'm Kira. Um, I graduated in 2020. Um, I have a chemical engineering degree and I also joined SFC in 2020. Sweet. Thanks, guys. Um, so for those of you who are just seeing SFC for the first time, we are an advocacy group made by students and young professionals for students and young professionals. And we believe that Canada can have a strong future in resources, the economy and the environment. Please connect with us on social media at any time to learn more about what we do. Um, today, we have Cole Narvison, who is a recent graduate at the University of Calgary and holds a degree in both geology and geophysics. While in university, he was very active in leadership and volunteering, holding BP roles in several student clubs. He has worked in the energy industry on a diverse range of assets, while on internships at Pipestone Energy Corporation, Suncor Energy, and his most recent role at Eivor Technologies. At Suncor, Cole worked in the Water and Closure Technology Development Team, where he supported the development of innovative industry disruptive technologies that aim to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, clean up tailings ponds, and reduce the impact to local wildlife within the surrounding Suncor's oil sands operations. Cole has worked at Eivor for over a year and supports global geothermal prospecting and feasibility efforts with a focus on Europe and the Americas. Um, just before I hand the floor over, please know that attendees are encouraged to ask questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A box below, and we will address all of these at the end of the session. Thank you so much for joining us today, Cole. Um, I'm going to hand the floor over to you now, and uh, you can take it away. Awesome. Thanks. I'll just uh, share my screen. All right. Um, I believe it's up okay. Yeah, uh, pretty excited today to giving this presentation. I, uh, I'm not really sure everyone's background uh, with geothermal, but uh, I'll start out pretty simple and then maybe get a little bit more complex with uh, some of the newer technologies. So a bit of an overview. Uh, yeah, like I said, pretty, pretty simple to start. What is geothermal and its history? What are some benefits and challenges? Uh, and then what are some new technologies that look to basically overcome those challenges? Um, and then a little bit of a future outlook thing. So what is geothermal energy? Well, in Greek, uh, geo means earth and thermal means heat. So it's basically heat from the earth. Um, so where does this heat come from? Well, a large majority of it is uh, primordial heat from when the planet formed and accreted, uh, which is sort of residual and, and trapped inside, which hasn't been lost yet. And then secondly, there's a bunch of heat that's uh, produced from the radioactive decay of elements, uh, mainly you know, uranium, thorium, potassium. Um, an interesting thing to keep in the back of your head for this presentation is the average geothermal gradient around the world is between you know, 20 and 30 degrees Celsius per kilometer. So we'll say for simplicity around 25. And so that means that for every kilometer you go depth wise into the ground, that it's gonna be you know, 25 degrees Celsius hotter. So, you know, two kilometers, 50 degrees Celsius, three kilometers, 75. But, you know, in a lot of places where geothermal happens, it's way higher than that. And some places around the world where maybe they aren't ideal for geothermal might be lower. Um, so what is geothermal energy used for? Uh, well, it's used uh, kind of in two different categories. One is direct and one is indirect. So direct, I kind of think of it as like heating, anything that has to do with like cooking or food spas like cleansing uh, and then there's indirect which is sort of that power generation so you'll see on this chart on the right um, with increasing temperature you start at the very very bottom with uh, geothermal heat pumps and so geothermal heat pumps i i won't talk too much about them today they're really awesome but uh just not as interesting as some of this other stuff so geothermal heat pumps are usually less than 40 degrees celsius uh, temperature wise and depth wise they're you know less than basically less than 100 meters ish uh, depth. Um, then you'll see you go as you move up in temperature, you go into all these sort of direct heating uses usages. So like clothes drying, drying of food, uh, aquaculture. Um, and then as you get hotter temperatures, 
you start going to binary or flash like geothermal uh, electricity generation. So history of geothermal, um, the earliest sort of human geothermal or one of the earliest human geothermal um, sort of usages was in uh, Roman spas. So, you know, soldiers would go, uh, you know, have a hot tub and be chilling, uh, maybe before a big fight or something. I don't know. Uh, this is, there's a lot of them are still around They're uh, maybe just a little bit, um, you know, uh, kind of crumbling to the ground a bit. And then the first sort of indirect or, or power generation uh, usage is, uh, is, I believe, lar in Largarello uh, geothermal field in Italy. Um, and so that's a field that still runs. And I've actually looked at some data there uh, before. But if we're, if we're thinking like, you know, really outside the box, like we're humans, the, the first people to use geothermal. And I would argue, you know, um, maybe not, like maybe some animal has potentially used it in the past before. So if you think about examples around the world, like Japanese macaw monkeys also use geothermal to heat up when it's really cold out. Um, so something kind of, you know, on the lighter side to consider. Um, so what's traditional geothermal? And I'm going to assume everyone kind of has an understanding of like drilling wells. Uh, but even if you don't, I'll, I'll kind of break it down. So you'll have a geothermal resource or a reservoir, which has geothermal fluids in it. And basically you drill a well going into it, similar to oil and gas. But the only thing is you, instead of you know, extracting hydrocarbons, you're extracting hot fluids. And so those hot fluids come up as steam or, or even still liquid, um, can produce electricity or heating. Um, and then they cool down. You can't just like throw them in a river or something. You got to put them somewhere. So then you have to inject them back down into the subsurface. And usually it's common practice to, to just do it in the same formation, maybe just at a, a little bit uh, adjacent to where your uh, production well is. And so couple of points that I want to make here is that for this to, you know, be successful, you have to have a geothermal reservoir with sufficient permeability. So permeability, if you're not like a geoscience person, basically that's just the ability of fluid to flow through the rock. So just imagine that that rock has like, you know, fractures or, or porosity or um, permeability to, to let the fluid flow from the geothermal reservoir up and into the well. Um, or for, there's permeability for you to be able to inject uh, fluid back into it and, you know, be able to do that successfully. So what are some key benefits? Uh, you know, baseload, non-intermittent, renewable energy source. When the wind's not blowing and when the sun's not shining, uh, this is a really uh, compelling uh, renewable energy source uh, for the energy mix. Um, you know, uh, nuclear is also very good, but you have to, uh, you know, deal with um, nuclear waste disposal. Uh, hydro is also really good, but it's kind of niche in that in certain locations, it, it works well in certain locations where, you know, there's flowing water like a river, but it can't be really used everywhere. Um, and then uh, going forward, uh, minimal land surface footprint is something else that I, I want to uh, emphasize. So this is a great example in uh, Stillwater, Nevada, where there's a solar geothermal hybrid plant and so the geothermal plant is this sort of orange box in the top, le top left corner. And then the solar plant, you can see the land usage of it is, is way larger. And so this geothermal plant is 10% of the land, but actually has 4.5 times energy output. And so I think at Ever, we use that uh, for our particular system, which we'll get into more later, that in, ter in terms of energy density for like land footprint, we're 30 times more energy dense than solar and 300 times more energy dense than wind. Uh, so it's it's something really to consider, especially if you're in a place like Japan, Singapore, um, or if you uh, have a really close tie to your uh, land and surface landscape. So in Hawaii, or even in certain indigenous communities, there's a really compelling argument to you know use if you're trying to use a clean energy source to use geothermal, um, and then transferable skills from oil and gas. This is something else, especially in this uh, presentation that I want to just key in on. And so, you know, this, this might look familiar to some people. This is taken from another presentation I gave. And so this is a seismic section. Um, so basically like a cross section in the ground and you can kind of see these subsurface structures. And so geothermal, uh, and I was sort of hinting at it a bit in the, the previous slide, like it's just exploration and production. You drill wells, you extract fluid. It's not hydrocarbon, but maybe it's just hot water. It's just everything. It, you, you, well, you need engineers and you need geoscientists and you need really smart business people. Um, 
for this particular example, you'll see that, you know, this might even look like a couple of reef structures or something. But uh, in geothermal, you're in different, you know, geological environments. And so, you know, these are actually uh, under, under uh, or like subsurface volcanoes. Um, so uh, an oil and gas company actually drilled into this thinking it was a, you know, oil and gas, oil and gas reservoir, but it was actually a volcano. So I don't know if that person lost their job, but the point I'm making is that, you know, there's a lot of similar skills to, uh, to be had. And if you're looking to pivot, geothermal is something that is uh, really applicable. So key traditional geothermal challenges. Key, traditional geothermal is kind of a niche energy source similar to hydro in that it, it, it only works really well in specific types of rock, usually near heat sources, um, such as a volcano. There's also, you know, sedimentary aquifer geothermal where it's just, you know, in a sedimentary basin uh, it's where oil and gas development is taking place too, but just slightly deeper. Um, one, another big challenge is sort of this drilling success. Uh, so you can drill a well, again, similar to oil and gas, but it's, maybe it's just a dry hole even though you've done all the due diligence in the world, or maybe there's just not sufficient uh, fluids or, or I guess like permeability for you to be able to extract fluid out of it and then not scalable. So again, because it's limited in certain locations, you can't put this anywhere or kind of scale up as well. Um, and so this is a, uh, a, a snippet from an article talking about this failed geothermal site in uh, Bavaria, Germany. And this is actually where these failed geothermal sites are unique opportunities for companies like Ever or these newer technologies because, um, and I'll speak to it more in a second, they can kind of go in there, all the subsurface work is done, but the new technology allows them to kind of still take advantage of the natural heat of the earth beneath of it. And so, yeah, these are challenges, but there's new technology that are that is looking to kind of overcome them. One of them is uh, enhanced geothermal systems, so uh, EGS, and so that's basically uh, stimulating the reservoir, if you think, um, you know, shale gas drilling, where you're drilling these uh, horizontal wells and then fract fracturing in different stages. Uh, that's essentially what this is. You're just creating sufficient uh, permeability or fractures for the uh, hot fluids to flow up and be able to use for electricity or heating. Um, something to that's kind of interesting is, you know, in geothermal, they never call it uh, fracking, it's it's always stimulation. And that's because, uh, especially in Europe or even Asia, uh, even if you say fracking, just like the word, people get really, uh, really up in arms. So it's, as as a general rule, it's just never used like that. And, and so for me, coming from an oil and gas background, like my previous places working Pipestone, more so than Suncor, like fracking is like, yeah, I really like fracking. But then going into this, it's, uh, I can't really talk about it that much. Um, and so the, with this, it's, it's good because you can go in more places than uh, traditional geothermal is limited to. Uh, there are concerns with, you know, induced seismicity or sometimes the, the uh, stimulation technique or methodology might not work perfectly, but it's still a unique uh, new technology that's, that's up and coming. So going to advanced geothermal uh, systems, you know, uh, ever uh, where I work has our own technology. And so basically it's it's basically set up as like a giant subsurface irradiator. So we use, we basically use oil and gas technology to, to put a new spin on geothermal to be able to put it anywhere. And so to try to explain it, there's two wells that go down and they basically think of it as like two horizontal wells and they, they meet in the middle uh, using magnetic ranging technology. And then there's different branches coming off of the side or laterals uh, to increase the surface area for conductive uh, heat transfer to take place. And so if you think about, okay, horizontal drilling, think of like shale gas, uh, Monty, Duvernay, whatever. And then multilaterals, think SAG-D, oil sands. Thermodynamic modeling, uh, also think oil sands. And so this is a lot of oil and gas uh, knowledge base and technology that's being put into something new. Uh, so I think it's, uh, and I'm biased, pretty, pretty interesting. And so you have this loop, uh, basically, where cold fluid goes down, it heats up, gets really hot, and then comes back up to surface, creates electricity or uh, heating, and then it cools back down. And the, dense, the difference in temperature and kind of density of the fluids cause this cycle to uh, circulate on its own. So using a thermosiphon effect, basically meaning if, if, if you kind of think of like a lava lamp where the light heats up the, the fluid with, uh, with inside of it, and it comes up. Uh, slowly to the top, cools down, um, becomes more dense, and then floats back to the 
to the bottom. That's the same sort of idea. And it just naturally circulates on its own where, you know, traditional geothermal, you need to have a, a pump that uh, has a parasitic load to it. There's no fracking, no induced seismicity. Basically this negates the risk of geological uncertainty because you're not focused on, you know, a specific type of rock or reservoir. A lot of times you're just, you're drilling deep enough until it gets hot enough. And then you're not concerned about like permeability or anything like that. Um, so, you, so this technology is basically trying to put geothermal anywhere, not just at volcanoes, um, but like even places like Alberta or, you know, the Western United States, uh, Germany, Netherlands. And this is just a, a short, a short video. So yeah, you can see that you can, uh, you know, only use one service location and have a bunch of branches going it down. So if there's a project that, you know, has more energy demand, you can kind of just drill more loop or even drill deeper. Um, the, if I get to the next slide somehow, um, the idea with drilling deeper uh, is that, you know, as you drill deeper, you get hotter. And so if you can extract temperature or geothermal fluids of temperature that's way higher, your uh, energy uh, output drastically increases. So there's this other type of geothermal basically called super hot, which is looking to um, capitalize on those super hot fluids. And so basically super hot geothermal is trying to produce geothermal fluids, which are super critical. And so if you look at this definition, that's like the mobile phase of substance intermediate between liquid and vapor maintained at a temperature greater than its critical point. And so this is like people trying to drill into the sides of volcanoes. Um, there's been over 20 wells worldwide that have reached super critical temperatures, but they haven't been super critical conditions because they haven't had high enough pressures. Uh, there's also wells in the world in Hawaii, uh, Japan, um, Iceland that have drilled into magma. And the reason they know they've drilled into magma as well as the you know, the drillers already kind of knowing is that their drill cuttings that come up the side of the well, if you're familiar with oil and gas, are not rock anymore. They're actually glass. So the, the drilling fluids have almost like shock cooled uh, the magma and then the drill cuttings coming up to surface is just like solid glass. So that's pretty cool. One of the most common places to find these supercritical systems is around like a cooling intrusive. So this would be places like Japan, um, the geysers in California, Los Humero, hum Los Humeros in Mexico, um, that sort of thing. And so Ever uh, actually is, is currently drilling a project in the uh, United States right now, the Southern United States called Ever Deep. And it's uh, aiming to be the hottest or the deepest and hottest directional geothermal well uh, ever uh, in history. And so this is something that, uh, you know, is super exciting. It's, it's like all the buzz that's around here at work right now. Um, and so basically, basically, we've gone from our Everlight demonstration project near Rocky Mountain House, Alberta, and then uh, kind of proved up a lot of the features of our technology, and then gone into like our, our second stage, we call it kind of Everloop 1.0, which is this, you know, sedimentary basin, you kind of go horizontal and stay within a, a certain formation in the subsurface, and then going into this third sort of iteration, which is this Everloop 2.0, which can be put, you know, in places that don't have sedimentary basins, can kind of be put anywhere in the world. Uh, and so this is something that we're trying to de-risk right now. And it's, uh, it's super exciting. And so this is in like hard crystalline granitic or yeah, like crystalline rocks. And so some of the, the key um, outcomes that uh, we're hoping to get out of this project is that, you know, demonstrating hard rock drilling technology. So it gets, uh, you know, compared to sedimentary rocks, hard rock drilling is more expensive. And so we're trying a few different things. Uh, we're, and uh, I don't know if I can talk to actually the, those. Um, and then hot rock drilling. So is our technology and modeling uh, up to par and is our, is our equipment able to withstand some of these super hot uh, temperatures, uh, multilateral drilling in, in those conditions and then drilling parameters and project costs. So we, we really want to prove, you know, high rates of penetration while we're drilling and then long bit life because uh, that kind of economics wise uh, helps us a lot, de-risk this technology. And so this, uh, and I'm super optimistic about it, when it goes well, we'll hopefully open up this whole commercial geothermal space uh, 
being able to put this anywhere in the world. And so one of the big knocks against us is this sort of thing like, oh, okay, yeah, you're, you're drilling so much, you're drilling so deep, it's going to cost so much money. And so, you know, drilling historically in, in all these different fields or, or formations has, has gone down uh, over time through learnings and newer technology. And so it's one of those things, you know, like drilling costs are going to come down. It's just a matter of for those costs to come down, you need to like start the learning curve. Like uh, you don't have to... Uh, be amazing to start, but you have to start to be amazing sort of deal. And so this is something that we're again, super excited about because uh, we're we're now drilling. Um, and so these are like Montney, DuVernay, et cetera, showing the price uh, coming down. And so just to sort of cap this off and um, uh, kind of leave people with something to think about today for the future geothermal, these are, are two figures that I just like stole randomly. And so this is like electricity prices, I believe. And you can see it's super, super high all of Europe, uh, you have a lot of uh, Russian um, influence and, and I'm sure everyone with the Ukraine war kind of has an idea of this, but uh, just in case you have all of these countries being super reliant on Russia for gas and oil or hydrocarbons and some of these other countries. And so if there's, how do I say it? If there's problems even like, okay, Canada doesn't have the correct infrastructure to you know export oil and gas to be able to help with this or something like that, like geothermal with this with, with these newer technologies uh, and you're able to basically help decarbonize a lot of these countries and uh, help them get off of Russian gas um, or hydrocarbons and geothermal is pretty popular in like Italy and Germany uh, in the upper Rhine Grob and Netherlands and so uh, in Europe especially not so much well electricity but more so uh, district heating is something big where geothermal can play a huge part in uh, helping decarbonize and then, uh, yeah, large, large amounts of money right now are being invested in geothermal um, for decarbonization and, and energy security. Uh, so yeah, it's a pretty ex exciting space. I, um, again, sort of hinted at it, it came from oil and gas into this, and it's kind of on the leading edge of, of innovation and, and uh, get to work in, on projects all around the world, which is pretty cool. Uh, I never thought that I'd be going into geothermal, uh, you know, when I was in university, I was pretty hell bent on oil and gas, but and I still like oil and gas, and I think it's going to be here for a long time. It's just, um, you know, this is something new that I could, uh, you know, be a part of, and I uh, have no regrets so far. So this is this is kind of my presentation. Um, I guess I can take some questions if people have them. I may or may not have answers. See. Amazing. Well, cool. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, that was fantastic. Mm -hmm.